Great, thanks everyone. Hi, my name is Mitchell Head from Te Kotahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato in New Zealand. Hope you can see my slides there. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Cool, so I'm very grateful to be here again and I'm excited to share about my journey researching consciousness and particularly today about plant-derived psychedelics and some indigenous considerations around researching and commercialization of these sacred gifts. I'll begin with some background of my journey in research into altered states of consciousness and toward plant medicines before exploring some indigenous considerations around plant medicine research and development. And finally, some case studies applying these principles and research projects that I'm beginning to explore now. So my research work first began during my master's degree investigating the mechanisms of anesthesia, where we developed a novel version of ketamine without the troubling clinical side effects of nausea hallucinations. Interestingly, and as discussed at this conference this week, I also found a correlation with the activation of the supraoptic nucleus and the duration of the hypnotic period upon waking from anesthesia. My goal here was that by understanding the mechanisms by which these amazing molecules called anesthetics are able to reversibly turn off our experience of reality, that we might be able to utilize this mechanism to induce optimum states of consciousness. And I presented this work at this, the last TSC conference. Next, I began to focus on other states of consciousness, particularly reward and motivation. During my PhD work, both here in New Zealand and at the University of Minnesota and the VA hospital in Minneapolis, USA, I worked on projects studying drugs that influence reward and motivation, most relevant being a project investigating the neurophysiological effects of alkaloids extracted from the tobacco plant to combat obesity in veterans. We found some interesting findings where the alkaloid anatabine would increase physical activity and another alkaloid, nor nicotine, would reduce food intake, combining to produce reduced body weight. And this was my first foray into plant-derived medicines. Subsequently, my PhD work developed a novel therapeutic drug combination that acted in concert to target both the drive to consume and the reward derived from consumption resulting in reduced food intake and body weight. Most recently, I worked as postdoctoral fellow at University of Minnesota's Department of Neuroscience, where I began to use this background to work toward inducing optimum states of consciousness. Here, we used advanced techniques such as two-photon microscopy, optogenetics, and viral vectors to engineer populations of neurons in the cortex in order to modulate their activity resulting in being able to increase or decrease an animal's ability to learn a new task. Most interesting was being able to see neurons here firing in real time as an animal learns a new task and to increase learning ability. It has been great to see presentations this week using two photon microscopy and viral vector optogenetic techniques to investigate the effects of psilocybin on increasing dendritic growth. So finally, I have returned to my homelands in New Zealand to investigate plant-based psychoactive molecules and their therapeutic application. Working with Te Kotahi Research Institute at the interface of science and indigenous studies, I've been supported to embrace my indigenous New Zealand heritage and have learned a lot around uh, indigenous considerations in the research <laughs> development and commercialization of plant-derived drugs. My colleagues have recently developed a, a guideline framework for research with indigenous communities that I am excited to implement in my experimental work and it serves well as a case studies for these ideas. These guidelines describe guiding and operating principles for engaging with local communities in entheogen research. So first, the guiding principles ensure that the level of comfort for all parties is, is suitable, such as intentions, expectations, and duties of care. Importantly, this consent can change over time, so continued and open communication is paramount. Secondly, ensuring guardians have an appropriate level of control of the research. This may include involving local communities and designing the research questions that they want answered and it informs the methods by which this is achieved. Finally, ensuring the integrity of systems aims to guide sustainable sampling and ecosystem balance and ensures that the research contributes 
to helping the resources and associated systems continue to thrive. Secondly, operating principles include respecting the social, ecological, spiritual, and historical relationships that have culminated in the existence of the sacred resource and its use, acknowledging that sacred species are central to the ecosystem health, and respecting the role of the local communities as guardians of these resources. So to put these principles into action, in my first project, an indigenous owned company has begun exploring a novel cannabinoid derived from a native plant species. And I will work in partnership to begin testing its potential therapeutic application in vivo later this year. However, important indigenous considerations around its harvesting and the R&D process have been enlightening and have highlighted some important practices to consider when researching plant-derived medicines. Firstly, before harvesting samples of this native plant for study, the respective indigenous tribes that are guardians of the land on which it grows were contacted for permission, discussion, and inclusion in the project. Importantly, the research design should work with these communities to generate outcomes that are beneficial for the guardians of these resources and serve the wishes of their people. The guardians were included as stakeholders from the very start, ensuring prior informed consent was in place. Secondly, mutually agreed terms were defined ensuring that the research project serves the wishes of the community and helps the ecosystem to thrive. One way to do this is through ensuring access and benefit sharing with the guardians. Having access to the research outputs and data or data sovereignty helps ensure that benefits from the research are shared with the local resource guardians. Access and benefit sharing should ensure that the local people can use this research to help their community thrive, be it through non-monetary mechanisms, such as work and education opportunities from the research, or the return of technology discovered from the research back into the community. Perhaps this may happen through monetary benefits, such as royalties and joint ownership of intellectual property rights. This can become tricky as in some cases, Genetic mechanisms for the bioactive molecules in these sacred plants may be identified and then synthetically reproduced. Interesting questions arise here around whether isolated genes and synthetic analogs of these plant molecules maintain the spirit and traditional knowledge from the original species. Nonetheless, indigenous peoples who shared their sacred resources for research should continue to benefit from future commercial products that are developed from the insights and research on these native species. Another interesting point is around traditional knowledge. While we may use modern scientific methods to study the effects of these plant species, these local communities have utilized the resources for hundreds of years and have garnered a wealth of wisdom on their therapeutic application, methods of use, harvesting and growing. This traditional knowledge can be useful to guide research methods and application in clinical use, and attributing this wisdom to its guardians can empower and benefit these groups. Importantly, my colleagues have developed traditional knowledge labels that would allow this traditional knowledge and provenance to be attributed to these peoples in publications and outputs of scientific research. So therefore, once we had prior informed consent mutually agreed terms, we were able to set out with the guidance from the local communities to begin sample collection. This helped to inform how to find the species based on the traditional knowledge of the ecosystem and the best ways to ethically and respectfully harvest. We will continue to engage with these communities as we have tough conversations around the ethics of animal preclinical experiments and genetic research. We hope to do this by way of open discussions with a new podcast to engage with community leaders, legal and ethics experts and scientists to discuss the best way to serve the community interests. And I look forward to these conversations as we continue this research process. Finally, our next project approaches similar issues as we aim to conduct a novel study of psychoactive natural medicines in a cultural setting. 
So this is interesting, as the literature is starting to show a somewhat minimal therapeutic benefit of psychedelic-assisted therapy in clinical settings. And as we've all heard this week, set and setting can be a significant influencer of therapeutic outcomes in their use. So again, by engaging with local communities early on who have expressed a need for novel intervention for addiction in their communities, and then allowing these groups to help design the therapy, therapy process that best matches with their worldviews, this ensures that the research benefits the communities rather than the researchers exploiting resources without serving the guardians. So this includes understanding the worldview of the people, their traditional wisdoms on consciousness, and we cannot deny that these medicines seem to have a spiritual aspect to them, so this must be considered also. In this way, we may together develop a therapeutic framework that honors and benefits the guardians of these sacred species. Interestingly, in this study, we may be able to use the whole native mushroom as medicine rather than a synthetic psilocybin, as it could be considered a ceremonial religious practice. The documentation of the entourage effect in other plant medicines alludes to the fact that a vast range of potentially psychoactive alkaloids exist within plants and fungi, and one example of this is in different species of mescaline containing cacti, where there's different levels of um, harmaline alkaloids, and they, they are shown to modulate the effects of mescaline distinctly, producing a diverse experience and perhaps expressing a different spirit in each species. Importantly, ensuring that the therapeutic treatment matches the participants' worldviews and helps them to feel comfortable is the most critical aspect of the research design. Robin Carhart Harris this week shared how the strongest predictor of therapeutic benefit in psychedelic therapy study was the rapport between therapists and participant. One way to do this may be by letting the community help to inform the therapeutic practices. I'm further intrigued to explore if there was any traditional knowledge on indigenous use of psychoactive fungi in New Zealand. It would indeed be rare for an indigenous population to not historically use psychoactive plants and fungi in a ceremonial use. However, in 1907, a Cultural Suppression Act was set in New Zealand that made the communication of non-scientific medical knowledge a legal offence. So this traditional knowledge may have therefore been held and passed on by trusted elders within the community, as New Zealand Māori indigenous culture tends to pass knowledge through oral communications and stories. So by exploring traditional knowledge of these sacred species and their use, this could help inform the appropriate practices for their therapeutic application. In sum, the research and development process with plant medicines involves including traditional knowledge holders from the start of the research design process and ensuring the research serves the community goals, mutually agreed terms are defined and intellectual property derived from the research is shared and beneficial to the community. Finally, and most importantly, when developing therapeutic frameworks for use with native psychoactive species, that indigenous worldviews must be considered and ensuring that the community helps to inform the best therapeutic framework for its people. So I look forward to presenting um, the results of this study at the next TSC conference and navigating this interdisciplinary space. And this would not be possible without the support of our interdisciplinary team of legal and ethical experts in traditional knowledge. And I wanna take the time to acknowledge and thank my collaborators on this exciting journey. Thanks very much. Under what lens of academia and under what modes can you incorporate things like indigenous knowledge? So you mentioned things like oral tradition. There's also things like um, what academia would consider religious beliefs around like uh, treating things as, as conscious entities or doing practices in a particular way, um, which can really be considered a, a form of technology, you know? And so are you kind of thinking like taking... <laughs> How do you kind of fuse these things? Is it like anthropology or like more of a religious sort of academic approach or um, to incorporate these other ways of knowing into our way of knowing to diversify and really deepen our way of knowing? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I unfortunately missed the first part, but 
Um, that's a really good point. And that's something that I'm really aiming to do with um, collaborating with other experts in um, legal ethics and anthropology. Um, and that really is our goal, trying to integrate um, different worldviews of consciousness and, and plant medicines into a academic scientific um, framework. Um, so I agree, it's very challenging to do, but um, I'm excited to be on that process because um, I think it's important when you're looking at these medicines that, that really do have a spirit um, to look into the other aspects rather than just like um, scientific quantification. So um, it's a really great question and um, I don't have all the answers to that, but um, that's what we're, we're looking to do in the future and, and collaborate with other experts on that as well. So thanks for the question. Yeah, wonderful. I look forward to seeing how your work progresses. Thank you. Other questions for Dr. Head? Dr. Head, maybe a question here. In terms of the historical use in New Zealand, yeah. what uh, plant medicines have background in history and tradition there? Yeah, that was an interesting point. Like I mentioned, it's every other indigenous population that we've looked at has a tradition of this. And we don't really have any tradition of psychedelic use here in indigenous populations, which is, is quite surprising. Um, I feel like that might have just been lost through the, the um, legal suppression of being able to discuss these issues. And so perhaps that's become so underground that it's just not shared anymore. So um, we're looking forward to trying to explore um, the use of psychedelics in New Zealand, but historically there's not a lot of evidence for it. And um, being that the culture is very oral in the way that they discuss their um, their histories, there's not a lot written down either. So we're in a lot of conversations with um, tribe leaders and um, building relationships um, for them to be able to open up and, and share some of these things. And um, if it's in their best interests for us to investigate these, um, these plant medicines. So yeah, good question. Beautiful. Well, lovely work you're doing. Thanks for presenting and uh, coming to us from halfway around the world. All right, all our best. All right, now we're gonna segue to something quite different. Um, we're gonna hear from Michelle Joy, who's beaming in from uh, Pennsylvania. She is a psychiatrist who works at the University of Pennsylvania, Director of Emergency Mental Health Services. And she's gonna be talking to us about touch and psychedelic medicine and the issues around the ethics of consent. And I've gotta tell you, I think this is uh, very much a hot and um, concerning topic. We deal with it in our MDMA research on a week by week basis. So. I'm very interested, and um, Dr. Joy, you are up. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So thank you for having me today. Um, basically, I'm glad to follow after the last person because I wanted to start by saving space to recognize indigenous communities. Uh, this quote is from Lisa Redbear, who made note of the important history of indigenous persons with using psychedelics. For thousands of years, many have used them in celebratory religious and healing contexts. Colonialization has distanced people from the land in many ways, and the current state of psychedelics can echo that. It is the collective our job to recognize this and ensure to work to a degree of justice, equity, respect, and humility in clinical and research practices. And I think it's important to keep this concept at the forefront of our work. So I thank you for that, and including the last speaker. <laughs> So now to the talk. I wanted to first set up the contours for the questions I will be asking to frame the rest of the talk. The overarching question is whether the experience of psychedelics affects, can affect, does affect, a person's ability to consent to therapeutic touch. Does a person maintain or lose their autonomy under the effects of psychedelics? Or you might even ask whether autonomy is enhanced. And the answers may vary depending on the specific medicine at hand. In this talk, I'm discussing both the classical psychedelics and the empathogens. And we might think about whether effects might change uh, of the ability to consent to touch with respect to phenomenologies of the medicines. So we can look at these questions in the context of capacity for medical decision-making and informed consent. Does the patient maintain the capacity to make a decision about therapeutic touch when using psychedelics? Does the patient think about whether it's important or do we think about whether it's important to, to consider both the person's ability to make those decisions while experiencing the medicine's effects 
as well as in advance of the encounter. Because we can also think about whether the experience is ineffable and thus unable to be a part of an inadequate informed consent. Does the self fundamentally change through this process? And can one version of the self consent for another? Now I'll just quickly review some of the effects of psychedelics, but particularly with an eye to effects on potential consent capabilities. We're here at a conference on consciousness, so it's clear that changes with regards to content. And by consciousness, I mean percept, perception, affect, and cognition. This includes synesthesia, derealization, mysticism, past life experiences, ineffability, visuals, etc. I think the ego dissolution is particularly relevant given its inherent change, of course, in the perception of the self. Each medicine has some unique features, of course, such as drastically altered perception of time with ketamine, auditory effects of ibogaine, ibogaine, psilocybin, and LST share visual phenomena and visions. Throughout this conference, we've seen reference to the potential importance of peak or mystical experiences with regard to the clinical efficacy of psychedelics. Such experiences have been described as consisting of unity, sacredness, ineffability, and awe. They tend to be vividly remembered, intrinsically valued, and perceived as truthful. Examples include being one with the universe, reliving memories, encountering otherworldly beings, and facing one's death. Relevant to our discussion is the noetic quality with which one feels they are acquiring truth. Because can new insights change a person's orientation towards decisions about touch? And how can a clinician prepare someone for something so transcendent and indescribable? Because essentially it's built into the process. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy consists of various sessions, including the preparatory ones. Those are when the process of informed consent begins and also where the therapeutic relationship is established, the patient's background is reviewed and intents for dosing are explored. Dosing sessions focus on the internal experience with psychotherapeutic support. Individuals generally lay down with eye shades and music. Sessions are described as non-directive and instead guided by what is termed the patient's inner healing intelligence. Later integration sessions support the process of meaning making. Building on the idea of psychedelics as bestowing perceived truths, the clinical wisdom is that this information comes from within the patient, of course not discounting any sense of interconnectedness. If it is true that a person develops insights that maintain veracity and come from inside, are those not valid foundations for changing a person's decision about touch, especially if these revelations could not be communicated and anticipated beforehand? Therapeutic touch is optional. But if it occurs, it does so during the dosing sessions. The intent is to provide reassurance and comfort, though such touch is of course not an element of traditional psychotherapy. A clinician might, for example, hold a patient's hand to offer support during the processing of a difficult emotion. And the primary organization for MDMA studies, MAPS, has a therapy manual that includes language about the potential importance of mindful touch and healing. It also makes note of the potential adverse effects of withholding touch, so please keep that in mind. And this manual is currently under review by the FCA. The MAPS Code of Ethics also discusses discusses touch in saying that it is only practiced by competent, experienced clinicians. The Code of Ethics also emphasizes the importance of obtaining informed consent for any touch. It explicitly states that touch is never of a sexual nature. MAPS directs clinicians to obtain informed consent during the preparatory sessions. At that time, how, when, and where a person might be touched is discussed. The potential risks and benefits of touch are discussed, though it should also be noted that unless there are impeding elements, consent is typically thought of as a continuous process rather than a single event, and that a person can change their mind if capable at any time. So even before inviting in any sort of metaphysical or epistemological framing, the facts of the clinical encounter lend themselves to unique power dynamics, even when compared to typical medical or therapeutic relationships. Therapists gain some power really from the zeitgeist of this cultural moment of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and the idea of psychedelic exceptionalism. Personal use of the medicine and therapists can likewise be tied to a degree of grandiosity. Research shows that narcissism is correlated with sexual abuse of patients. Patients themselves are in a vulnerable state of enhanced suggestibility. 
themes of clinical psychedelic experiences include nudity, sexual expression, and love. And psychedelic psychotherapeutic treatment has been considered as particularly susceptible to boundary crossings and violations. And this is important because touch, especially of an unwanted nature, can have negative clinical consequences. This includes re-traumatization, as well as it serving as an exploitative entree into sexualization. The clinician, of course, also piece, faces potential sim, uh, criminal, civil, and regulatory repercussions if the situation goes awry. If we take the parallel of sexual assault in the community, contemporary pr culture portrays it as a straightforward manner. It's very easy. It's very easy. So this is a long, well, like two and a half minutes. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but by the British police about consent, just to give an example of how consent is portrayed in the community. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a problem. So et cetera, et cetera, it goes on and discusses if someone's unconscious, you don't force feed them tea and except everything like that. Let me, uh, the next slide, oops. Um, but we know it's more complicated than that, right? Uh, so this writer published various pieces on her treatment during the MDMA clinical trials. In this piece she writes, when the tears finally came, they spread like bullet wounds across my therapist's chest. There were two with me at all times, hugging me often, holding me as I cried, providing the touch I craved as much as I feared, denied yet ached for, with the longing of a child unsure what was safe. Therapeutic breakthrough occurs on the edge of consent. They pushed me hard, my toes curling in protest. But each time I felt they were there, holding my fragments together until the wounds mended me enough to carry on. It should be noted, however, that this was published, I believe, prior to her legal uh, later legal claims of sexual assault in the, in the therapy. So we know consent is or can be complicated. The idea of informed consent being a process brings us to various examples of altered consent. The first is which a patient gives consent for touch but then rejects it. In this case, it seems the autonomy is maintained and there's no clear reason why a clinician should engage in touch, unless of course the patient were to be unsafe. In the second example, some sort of physicality may be required to contain the patient. Perhaps they are about to fall or unable to walk to the bathroom by themselves. But where the rubber really hits the road is when the patient declines touch during the consent process, but then changes their mind. In this situation, the patient who previously refused therapeutic touch then asked to be touched while experiencing psychedelic effects. How do we determine whether the patient maintains the ability to consent to touch to cite this phenomenology we've discussed. We can briefly look to medicine and the law for foundations and prepare. The history of self-determination is certainly a relevant one. At least in the United States, courts have long held that a capable adult can determine what happens with their own body. It's actualized every day. And landmark examples have included refusal of treatment, including life support, birth control, and abortion. It's generally held that individuals are competent to make such decisions unless the courts say otherwise. And this legal concept of competency is distinct, but however related to the medical notion of capacity. Capacity is an individual sets of abilities to make diverse healthcare decisions. For example, someone may maintain the ability to refuse aspirin, but lack the capacity to refuse life-saving surgery, perhaps in the context of believing aliens are causing the symptoms. Now, in a healthcare setting, medical decision making capacity is required for the process of informed consent. The patient must be able to understand a medical intervention's risks, benefits, side effects, and alternatives. When questioned, the assessment of such capabilities includes one, the ability to communicate a preference with sufficient consistency, two, to listen to and comprehend risks, benefits, timelines, and probabilities, three, to assign subjective value to understood facts and four, to reach logical conclusions from the starting premises. 
So we know what prongs are uh, required, but do we know how psychedelics affect them? Do we think that psychedelics inherently affect uh, communication, comprehension, and logic? We can look briefly to alcohol and the parallel of sexual assaults while intoxicated. Statute tends to write about vague cognitive processes required for consent. I chose a couple locations near me and in Arizona for comparison. So in Pennsylvania and federal jurisdictions, consent includes the ability to appraise or control conduct. In Arizona, a person is unable to give consent with, quote, impairment of cognition. In New Jersey, a person must be able to reasonably assess risks of their actions. So I bring these examples up to show that even looking at statutory language, it's not clear exactly what is required to consent to another person's, in this case, sexual touch. Now in New Jersey, the courts have commented that just because a person has drunk some alcohol does not mean they cannot consent to sex. That is, drinking alcohol may affect one's ability to consent, but it does not necessarily mean that. And what applies to alcohol, even though we all know it's a very different drug, lightly affects for psychedelics as well. Capability to consent is affected by phenomenology and intensity of effects. As such, it's briefly worth reviewing the individual medicine. In the following slides, effects most relevant to an individual's ability to consent to touch are highlighted. I'll go through them quickly, but please think of not only the effects on conscious ability to consent to touch, but also on imbued emotions. So psilocybin is known for bolstering connection, People feel they are more in touch with themselves, their emotions, and others. Positive changes are noted, particularly with regards to feeling open and social. Here are a bunch of narratives, and with just skimming them, you can tell the experience is ineffable. It's about connection of giving and receiving love. Now, LSD affects many aspects of consciousness, including one's self, sense of self. Aspects of the self that change includes one value, and this change happens in the context of experiencing love and connection. As, as an enactogen, MDMA decreases fearfulness and increases trust. People feel bonded through compassion and empathy. The experience of safety is paramount, supported by love and self-inquiry. So we see at least of those three medicines, uh, they have shared and varied effects that might influence a person's ability to consent. That is, trust, insight, and compassion might affect communication, understanding, appreciation, and rationality about touch. And it matters because some of the changes that we see are not short lived. Both psilocybin and MDMA, for instance, have been found to change personality features. This includes decreased neuroticism, but also increased extroversion, openness, and conscientiousness to varying degrees. Even one dose of psilocybin has been found to have long lasting changes. With MDMA, the changes are tied to therapeutic efficacy. And other features described as malleable include rigidity, ego structure, compassion, socialization, personal narrative, and philosophical worldview. There is also a shift toward perceiving universal consciousness, fatalism, and panpsychism. So if these medicines so profoundly change the self, is the patient who is taking it intoxicated to the point of being incapable or rather are they newly insightful and aware. If there are changes to the self and the future self was beyond description, should the previous self be fully responsible for consenting to the new one? Now, of course, discussions can occur during integration sessions and change course, but the effects of psychedelics have been described as context dependent and possibly withholding touch can negatively affect the therapeutic milieu and the overall effects of the medicines. So unlike many of the sessions of this conference, I don't have answers, but rather a series of questions at the intersection of medicine, ethics, philosophy, and the law. The practice of psychedelic psychotherapy is becoming increasingly common, and the answers to these questions are of practical relevance. However, the current discussion within my field could also benefit from understanding more about the science of consciousness from the people here. What we're looking to understand is really the effects of psychedelics on consciousness as it relates to a person's ability to request therapeutic touch. Is touch carved out as a specific capacity and desire that is unaffected by the cognitive and emotional effects of the medicines? Or might changes to perception, affect, cognition, and the self significantly alter one's capacity to consent to therapeutic intervention of touch? I'm happy to hear anyone's thoughts or questions.
Thank you, Dr. Joy. Um, that was really, I think, probing and inquisitive, and it really highlights some of the challenges we face in this field. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience, either in person or online. Yes. Someone's coming up, just a second here. Hi, thank you. That was really informative and well presented. Um, my question is, how involved does the FDA have to be? And do you anticipate a more mindful community of people sitting on those panels that would represent the FDA? I mean, my opinion is that it's that it's pretty tough. They're pretty tough right now, maybe not as open. Like, do we see evolving changes in attitudes with the FDA? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, for the first part, this uh, for the first point, this is the first time that even a psychotherapy will be FDA approved, right? Because everything else FDA approved is going to be a medicine. And this is the first time that it's a combined medicine and manual. And so I think it's already kind of uh, expanding people's perspectives on what it means to be FDA approved. Um, there have been many kinks and hangups in this process to begin with, and I don't know all of the politics of it, but it has had to do with changing regimes and this and that. So right. I think there is a space to be more inquisitive um, and ethically conscious uh, about these, but I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. The FDA is likely to issue REMS guidelines when the medicine is rescheduled yeah. in the next year. And that may dictate a lot. We deal I agree. with it. I agree. I'm a closet our... prescriber. And so I deal with REMS all the time. And I think that, of course, it'll be in a similar uh, space. Other questions for Dr. Joy? Well, I guess one question, do you have any perspective, MAPS deals with this issue about challenges and ethics and boundaries by having two um, co-therapists involved in each session and then videotaping it. Do you have any thoughts about what you recommend for dealing with the complexities of this as the psychotherapeutic process evolves? I Again, I do think that um, MAPS has kind of, because of a lot of flaws already, um, accuses of sexual, accusation of sexual abuse and things like that, they have, you know, uh, some procedures in place. I think that MAPS and MDMA might be set up more ideally for this because, again, it's going to be an approved manual. Even with ketamine, we've seen kind of anyone can do anything with ketamine and it's out in the field and all this and that. And you know, MDMA is probably going to be under an anti-patent and it has this manual that might be FDA approved. And as much as we like or don't like regulatory agencies, um, I think it might be more important in this case, because I do think the dual therapist uh, is an important mechanism of safety, but I don't know where we're going with psilocybin and these other medicines. Um, and at the si same time, I think we have to think about justice and equity because paying for two therapists is doubly as expensive as paying for one. Um, so I think that there are ethics and justice questions involved in all of it, but I do like the idea. One of the things that I'm really thinking of is uh, a lot of like training programs where you have one therapist that you're painting, paying for and another therapist who is in training. So you have two people there, but are only paying for one because uh, one of my main points of justice and equity is bringing this to underserved communities, which I think we're at great risk of not doing. Yeah, lovely. Any thoughts about uh, how this changes in the context of group therapy with psychedelics? I haven't been trained specifically in that, but I do think that it will be meaningful. And I think, you know, you're spreading out attention in whatever way. So when you train in ketamine, when I train in ketamine, you're in a room of, you know, 60 people or whatever, and having this happen, I think that um, it will just it will require closer attention, not only to the therapist um, client relationship, but also to uh, 
interpersonal relationships between the clients, but I think we'll have to pay attention to that as well. But I'm excited for that in terms of access to the medicine. Lovely. Any other questions for Dr. Joy? Well, thank you for the thought provoking presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very you. much. All right. Take care. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Adam Safran, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And he's going to be talking to us on the varieties of conscious experience and altered beliefs, the Albus theory. So, Dr. Safran. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So, um, hi, I'm Adam. I am a research fellow at the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. And uh, today we'll share some ideas about uh, mechanisms of action for psychedelics. Uh, this work um, follows up on work by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston on the um, rebus model of psychedelics or relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. Uh, with this, um, most of you are probably familiar with this, but the basic idea is that um, most aspects of mind, um, in particular cortex, but uh, maybe all aspects of brain functioning can be understood in terms of a common process of hierarchical predictive processing. The idea is that minds and brains um, are constantly trying to predict um, what it is that they are going to encounter at all levels in a hierarchy of predictions or beliefs. And that what you do with this predictive processing, sometimes called predictive coding, is you only update these predictions where you get it wrong. And so you take where you have prediction error, then you kick that up to the next stage of hierarchical processing, update your predictions, send new predictions back down and see if that resolves a prediction error or not. And so the idea is thinking of all of cortex and maybe all of the brain in terms of this one process of minimizing your prediction error, where what you're predicting is uh, what you expect to be in the world and specifically what you expect to be in the world with you doing adaptive things. And in this view, the idea is that psychedelics um, will flatten your belief hierarchies and that they will cause your um, predictions to be attenuated or, or weakened or relaxed. And then you, you have more room for prediction errors to come in and update you. And this is part of how psychedelics work. Um, what I'm suggesting is that um, this is likely correct, um, but maybe by means other than we think, um, potentially not explainable in terms of this idea of predictive coding in a straightforward sense. And also that sometimes we might see the opposite effects or a strengthening of beliefs. Um, so the reason I would suggest this um, is that, um, so the idea of rebus is that you're, when you excite these layer five pyramidal neurons that are thought to encode your predictions, they become so excited when you excite them by this 5-HT2A receptor the classic psychedelics act upon, they become so excited, they fall out of sync with each other. And so they're unable to coordinate to create these top-down predictions as, as well. And this is how beliefs are relaxed. Um, what I'm suggesting um, is that in addition to rebus effects, we might though expect Cebus effects, which is this account might not apply along the whole dose response curve of psychedelics or across all psychedelic compounds at different portions of their dose response curves. More specifically, if you were to increase the gain on these neurons that will uh, shoot for distance and loop with the thalamus, it's not clear that this will necessarily result in them de um, becoming desynchronized. Rather, they might come into sync more readily and you could get your predictions to be strengthened. Uh, further, um, these L5 pyramidal neurons that um, are involved with the thought to encode predictions, um, they're not the only things that are being acted upon by um, 5-HD2A receptor stimulation. You also will see this at the um, superficial layers of cortex, um, these uh, layers two, three, which are thought to be where your prediction errors are basically being kicked up this hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having increased gain on these inhibitory units um, in the upper layers where your prediction errors are being registered, in theory, um, not only might you have 
strength in beliefs, but these might be further shielded from disconfirming evidence from the environment through this um, excitation of suppressing units or this excitation of inhibition resulting in more inhibition. Um, I think some reasons we might look to this with respect to hallucinations would be things like, um, and, and maybe with psychedelics, um, would be um, connections to things like dreaming, where you're in a state of being uh, shielded from the world, um, or um, the ways in which you'll get hallucinations with extended sensory, extended sensory deprivation, or with um, neuropsychiatric conditions like Charles Bonnet syndrome, where as people begin to, um, let's say you, you begin to go blind via some sort of neurodegeneration, people will then start to report um, increased um, hallucinations within the modality. So, um, that's the basic idea um, that I guess I'm putting forward to, um, today and have been working on is that in addition to rebus effects, we might expect Cebus effects, um, maybe particularly for low to moderate levels of 5-HT2A agonism. And if we get something like this rebus induced or this rebus like excitation induced desynchronization and relaxation of beliefs, that this might only apply for very high doses. And so this would potentially suggest different use cases for different doses with different compounds. Um, and so in this ALBUS model, the ALBUS model, um, ultra beliefs under psychedelics, the claim is that we're getting a combination, different mixtures of relaxed and strengthened beliefs in different ways. And that this is what we're going to need ultimately to have an adequate account of psychedelics and maybe different and certainly to substantial degrees, different accounts for different psychedelics. Um, so a brief comment is that uh, actually that this rebus account might more straightforwardly apply to ketamine than it does to um, classic psychedelics like with ketamine by um, basically um, inhibiting your NMDA receptors um, and also exciting these AMPA receptors you actually might be getting this sort of reduction of prediction and increase in prediction error. And then the rebus account might apply in a more straightforward and uh, dose dependent way. Although even there, I might expect complexity for something like an NMDA receptor antagonist, as opposed to a classic psychedelic. Um, so to try to depict this, um, so as you know, using this jargon of predictive processing or coding, we have these deep parameter neurons or superficial ones. So basically cortex, by deep and superficial, the idea is that cortex is like a napkin. It's about the thickness of a napkin, about the size of a dinner napkin, scrunched into the brain, and um, on the inside, you got the wires. But if you take the napkin and you look at the, like if you cut it, the, the intersection, you'll look and you'll see there's six layers. And the deeper layers um, would be the ones that would loop with thalamus from these big synchronous complexes that be able to aggregate information from across different places and give you a kind of joint belief and that this is the thing you would use in predictive coding to basically suppress your inputs um, to, uh, and then uh, the difference between what you expected and what you observed would be your prediction errors that you use to update these beliefs. The reason we would expect something like this to happen um, is because it's, um, in, in general, it's, it's very efficient. It, it, it would be a quick and energetically efficient way of doing things. And there's multiple lines of evidence that suggest something like this is happening in cortex and maybe as a broader principle of neural functioning. Uh, so a rebus effect, you see right here, the, the, here's like a, this uh, red or pink here would be your synchronous complex. And you see it's uh, relaxed or it's smaller. And then you're seeing more prediction error, these like gray circles are coming in and you're getting more prediction error, more updating from the world. Um, a Cebus effect in contrast would say, well, maybe you're getting a strengthening of these beliefs. And on top of, and so you're getting more suppression from the strength and uh, belief, but not only, not only that, but maybe you're getting also like an across the board down regulation of your prediction errors, um, shielding the strength and belief from this, from disconfirmation from the environment. And the idea with Albus is that we are probably getting both Cebus and Rebus effects in different combinations in different parts of the brain with different levels of um, dosing sets, settings, et cetera. Um, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, so please like just take a cane and yank me or maybe give me a little warning, but it's all right. Um, so to go further with this, though, I think we have to be careful and not um, conflating uh, predictive processing with consciousness more generally or trying to take 
um, the complexity of cognition and like shoehorn too much of into predictive processing. Predictive processing is very powerful and a lot of cognition can be accounted for, but not always straightforwardly. And so I think we're gonna even need to get into theory, things like theories of consciousness, if we're gonna have an adequate account of what psychedelics are doing, because are we, isn't that what we want to know is the way that they modify our consciousness. Our, that's a large part of what we want to know. And so um, I'm not gonna get into this today, but the, some background is, you know, I've been cross-referencing across theories of consciousness, treating them all as being um, different degrees of correct in different circumstances, seeing different sides of, of the elephant. You know, these are all very smart people. And then if we cross-reference and look for points of um, intersection of what different people say, we might get a whole that's greater than some of its parts. I call this way of bringing things together, integrated world modeling theory. Um, can, I published on that elsewhere and you could read about it if you're interested. Um, but the basic idea and underlying all these ideas um, and, and with relation to psychedelics in terms of how it is, can you see something that isn't there or perceive something that isn't there is that all perception is like this, all perception. Um, I believe Frith might've been the first person to express this, but I'm not sure, maybe around a hundred, but it's, I, just butchered his name. But the idea is that your perception is an inference to the best guess and that sometimes these inferences can be wrong. And so visual, hallucin visual illusions show this. And the idea is that all perception is like a hallucination, but a grounded hallucination. All experience is like a kind of dream, but a grounded dream. Um, you're either tethered to the world through your senses or not. And But, it, it, but perception the whole way through is a, is a constructive act of inference. And that through this, there might be some computational principles from things like machine learning and artificial intelligence that are relevant for getting at this mind-brain connection um, uh, crossing these explanatory gaps with many devils and many details. And so like here you would see like one of these um, generative models from machine learning. This is an old school one, but in some ways it's better for getting at things like the phenomenology of imagination, which at least for me is a little bit fuzzy. Um, and so, but here the idea is your brain activity as the units of your brain are passing their messages instead of filling in this like one pixel array would be filling in all of your modalities in different combinations. And this happening iteratively over time would be your stream of experience. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a theory I'm working on about that. And that's so um, a lot of what I'll discuss right now draws upon ideas from attempting to basically bring together different theories to create a synergistic um, whole that's greater than some of its parts. Um, Draw some on cell and autosoys connect them harmonics mode framework to explain the functional significance of uh, different kinds of synchrony, um, specifically viewing them as um, enabling communication through coherence. The idea is that neurons, they have to all be kind of aligned in time for them to be able to um, pass their messages. Otherwise, just everything gets lost in the chaos. And so the messages have to come in with certain windows. And that synchrony part of what's doing is it's allowing um, these populations of neurons to establish coordination and communic for communication and to establish joint beliefs, where some of these beliefs, um, some of these synchronous complexes and the beliefs they entail might be your subjective experience. And I specifically am um, focusing on alpha frequencies as allowing for this um, basically establishment of a coherent, egocentrically centered um, feel, uh, point of view on the world. Uh, so basically um, the idea is if you are generating um, the uh, a filled in sensorium from a particular point of view, and you keep doing this through time, this might be something like the stream of experience. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have access to this or not, even a conscious access might be an additional thing, but that's the basic idea. So the idea now would be, if we're gonna talk about psychedelics and what they do and talk about rebus effects and sebus effects, we might need something a little bit more complicated than just like one predictive processing hierarchy. We're gonna have to get into that bridge between actually conscious perception um, how do you get there? And so, you know, you might think of basically these hierarchies of features being bound together um, with like faster rhythms, allowing for um, basically uh, local beliefs to be calculated like fast, small complexes. And these can be nested within uh, larger, more encompassing synchronous complexes and larger still. And through this multi-scale hierarchy of rhythms within rhythms within, within rhythms, binding things together, you can maybe get a compositional world where you have things 
relative to other things with particular properties. Um, and if you take all this and you organize it according to an egocentric perspective or your point of view, um, specifically, you know, people in the psychedelic science will talk in psychedelic neuroscience will talk about alpha as being particularly impactful. And I think it is. And part of the reason might be is that some of the locuses of alpha, alpha from places like the posterior cingulate and these midline structures, um, they're basically not only are they on top of all the different sensory modalities coming together. So they have all the information that can be brought together to establish a coherent perspective, but they receive information from basically um, the stretch receptors of the neck and the vestibular apparatus. So, you know, the yaw pitch and roll of your head and you're taking your whole sensorium together. And then if you bring all this together, you might have something like a point of view in the world. Okay. Point is that we might need to go into this kind of complexity if we're going to actually do an adequate job of explaining psychedelic phenomenology. And I try to do this with a preprint online that I'm preparing for publication um, called Albus. And so right here, I'm depicting um, sensation uh, with open eyes or imagination um, with or without open eyes um, under different doses and how this might potentially cause different patterns of strengthening or relaxing of beliefs at different levels of a belief hierarchy. So moving from things just like I am in nature or I'm seeing myself from an external fictitious point of view in nature, imagination. Um, and here I am. So what might a rebus effect look like? What might a Cebus effect look like? Um, what might uh, some combination of these look like and how much you get, the, get these under different doses, moving from uh, nor normal perception uh, to different kinds of alteration all the way through uh, heroic and extreme doses. And then uh, finally, and I think with some relevance to what's being discussed before in terms of like what do psych different psychedelics do and how might this impact um, different forms of cognition, if we think of the stream of experience, consciousness as, as a stream of experience, and we think of cognition in that respect, we're going to need to introduce even more complexity, specifically the way that um, basically the dynamics of the brain, these, these different estimates of what's in the world, are being stepped through time and orchestrated by the hippocampal system. I'm not gonna have time to get into this here, but the basic idea would be, you can potentially model what's happening, the phenomenology of different doses of psychedelics as potentially having more or less vivid perception and more or less coherence across frames of experience. Um, and so here I have like episode one, episode two, and that um, basically it seems that there's the a, a, a specious present, as James called it, there's this extended present moment has a certain duration. Ranges maybe from less than a second to maybe, you know, around three seconds. And, and then basically the hippocampus that's orchestrating this present moment has to, it seems like it has to reset itself. But so you have these rollouts to work with, and then you reset and you can have continuity both within this episode of imagining and thinking, and a lot can happen in three seconds, and also across these different um, frames of sense making. And so the idea would be as you're dosing, you might start to get even more vivid perception and imagination and a greater ability to be engaged with what you're doing, something more like absorption, um, not necessarily, and potentially something that's um, agency um, enhancing and cognition enhancing, like maybe for the use, reason that like a programmer in Silicon Valley might be doing this. They're not um, trying to be too altered, they're actually trying to be more engaged, um, more creative also, but also like they want focus. Um, and so then the idea would be like, as you're dosing more, you're seeing this gap between imagination and perception become uh, closer and closer. Cognition becomes more and more creative. You might have a little bit more of an imaginative runway to deal with, but at a certain point, um, you start to lose coherence. Things still keep becoming more vivid, but the extent that you have to work with before you start to lose coherence and have to reset your cognition um, goes down until eventually you're having extremely vivid, um, but not necessarily highly coherent. Um, it might have its own kind of coherence, but not coherent with respect to like normal waking consciousness and tying things together in like a way you can describe to others. It might be fairly ineffable, um, somewhat archetypal. Um, but that basically we can, by thinking of this sort of dose dependent modulation of the vividness of perception, and imagination, and the coherence of experience, um, I think you might be able to account for a lot of psychedelic phenomenology. I actually think we might need something kind of like these comics if we're going to do a good job, both um, just to describe, you know, what is, what is, it, what is it like, and even to do good cognitive science on this. Like this, uh, you know, this is the kind of detailed, handling of behavior, I think we're going to need so we don't get like lost in abstractions. And I think this is um, 
you know, the, this is basically like the business end of what's moving our mind around is us as conscious beings, imagining different outcomes of different with different valuings associated with them. And us as conscious value driven goal directed beings, I think that needs to be front and center in all these discussions. Um, so I think there is a lot of implications here in terms of different um, doses might have different use cases if you're getting different combinations of um, strengthened and relaxed beliefs under different circumstances. Um, you might have different interpretations of what psychedelic phenomenology means. Is it that, for instance, you're just removing an expectation and then uh, something strange comes up? Or are you potentially taking like your core priors, your core expectations that define you, and are those being revealed and manifested? Like, for instance, um, is it when you see fractals, is it that the brain is constantly expecting fractals because that's an efficient way of constructing a world? Or if you're um, having like, like uh, an entity encounter or a very rich sense of connection, is that a relaxation of your beliefs causing you your belief of your narrow self to be let go of and then you're open others? Could be. But in addition, maybe it's revealing, it's reflecting the fact that we're inherently intersubjective and interdependent right from the beginning before we're even people, that's how we become people. And so maybe these core priors, these core predictions, expectations that define us as the kinds of being we are, maybe those are being unmasked. And so you have very different interpretations of what psychedelics are telling you as microscopes for the mind under these different interpretations. And so I think we need to get into all this complexity of when we're having relaxed and strengthened beliefs and which ways with a complex, um, not just a single hierarchy, but you know the brain in all of its mess and experience in all of its mess and richness, but also experience qua experience. Then I think, uh, you know, maybe we might have a hope of, of something. So um, that's about it for now. And I realize I've run out of time. There's a little more work exploring this in the context of machine learning, um, artificial psychedelics for AI, which I won't be able to get into right now. And there's some more work coming up, uh, basically exploring this in the context of agency and Lebet phenomenon readiness potentials, um, basically using psychedelics as a window into understanding the micromechanics of agency and potentially vice versa, where disrupting the micromechanics of agency might be part of what gives rise to some aspects of psychedelic phenomenology. And that, uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope some of that made sense. Uh, please don't hesitate to get into contact, me, uh, contact with me if you have any questions or want to discuss. Thank you, Dr. Saffron. Thank you. Let's see if we have any questions from our audience here. Uh, we've got somebody coming up. I hope I didn't go too much over. Sorry if I did. Hello, hello. Hey, Adam, what's going on? It's Nico from Tiny Blue Dot. Great talk, man. Okay. Got to see you as usual. Um, I had a question regarding just altered belief states in general and, and whether or not it's you think it's feasible, especially with this model, for the insertion of net new beliefs, or if a hierarchy needs to be in place that is then altered, or if it's possible to insert you know, a completely new conceptual framework during that type of you know, peak synchronous nearing uh, criticality state. Uh, I think it might, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I think very like relevant to the social impact um, and like, how we understand things like these changes in metaphysical beliefs people are observing that uh, Michelle just mentioned. Um, but I think not just as a possible, but in some ways, like maybe like the best to the extent that it's possible, this might be one of the best ways of doing it. You're having states of intense uh, perceptual vividness um, accompanied by uh, reduced um, metacognitive monitoring of different kind, metacognitive monitoring. And so like that, like, let's say, some of this does correspond to something like maybe, I don't know, like uh, fr frontal theta is a little bit weaker, alpha is a little bit weaker, but man, that beta is kicking. And so these percepts are just like, you know, realer than real and in novel combinations uh, that seems like a really good opportunity to, to move to move around your yourself and world model. And then on top of this, um, uh, Gould Dolan has some interesting, you know, findings about these plasticity windows where like the more intense the trip, um, there seems to be this opening of these critical periods that are usually closed off things, maybe like, um, uh, perineural nets, like around, like that basically keep the, the synapses locked in place. Those seem to open in a dose dependent fashion, something like I will gain up to two months. So, uh, 
I mean, I, I don't know what's possible, but like, I think, you know, maybe the, what was it like MK ultra, whatever that program was like, wasn't too off base. Or, or if you think of it like traditionally, basically in training yourself into a hopefully harmonious social field or a coming of age or like taking on a new role in society, I think that that might be a good, like uh, a benevolent pro-social brainwashing that we all yeah. need to like be together. I, I don't know. That's how I was thinking of it too. Great. Yeah. Thank you again for your answer and awesome talk. One more question. Short one, perhaps. Yes. Hi, this is uh, Maria Feeney from the Center of Consciousness Studies. We've talked also. Um, wonderful talk. I had some, I had, I was wondering if you could answer um, your thoughts about how sometimes I guess maybe it has to do with this critical period, but how you see an underground psychedelic use, it's usually outside the context of um, tradition, like let's say the underground ayahuasca communities in the US um, that are totally disconnected from cultural heritages, how you almost see this reaffirmation of beliefs or reaffirmation of ego um, even, and that this can, this can, be kind of perpetuated by repeated doses. So do you think that's actually just due to set and setting and reinforcement of beliefs um, post ceremony or how, could you comment on that? I mean, I think you'd have a much better sense than I would in terms of like, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this mostly um, just like as a, you know, a systems neuroscientist and like, you know, cognitive geek, but um, some of the things that are coming to mind in terms of, um, so it's like, if, so like, let, let's say the, the, the normal modes of sense making are altered in some ways, that doesn't mean that like, what, what, what's, what gets us, that doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily explore something different that's going to cause you to have some sort of paradigm shift. But, but the thing I want to come back to is there actually does seem to be like, um, uh, in the metaphysical belief change, there does actually seem to be a little bit of evidence it looks like from some of the mediation analyses for something like social contagion, where it looks like um, some, some of the beliefs, so it, it was like the extent to which people had this group effervescence feel was mediating some of the different beliefs. And so part of that could be like your metaphysics change just by like having this like collective effervescence with others. But the other is, maybe under those conditions, you actually were having beliefs, you were abs absorbing beliefs that are being transmitted through this sociocultural nexus. Anyway, so the exactly what's happening in, in the underground and whether that would or wouldn't um, be likely to result in what kinds of belief dynamics, don't know. But um, I, I could see like what being, but what is being relaxed and strengthened with combinations. It's just not at all given that it would be either benign or harmful. It seems like just like uh, being very intentional uh, would make all the difference in terms of the direction this goes and that this is in some ways um, potentially not univalence, but um, this opportunity to like, like you can bifurcate in any direction in a potentially strong way and that like, without an, a clear intention there, um, it may not be desirable. The, the default might not be therapeutic or good for individuals or society. Thank you. I think we're going Thank to you. have to move on. Thank you, Dr. Saffron. And we appreciate your perspective. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Rick Morley. He's from the School of Social Work and Department of Psychology at Texas State University, assistant professor. He's going to be talking about violence, aggression, mindfulness, and the brain. Dr. Morley. Thank you. Thanks for uh, holding it, sticking around this late in the day. Um, so first thing I'm going to apologize to you ahead of time. I went really crazy with the slides and to make sure that I stay within time, I may fly through some or just skip some entirely. But anyways, uh, my colleague Logan uh, is uh, currently doing a moderation in another room right now. So that is why he's not here too. But... I'm sure, uh, I, I, you could probably tell one of those things does not look like the other, as you'll find out. So anyway, so violence is a big social problem. These are just some examples of, uh, of how violence is. And this is mostly focused on violence that we consider as a crime, or as at least how the state is a crime. 
This does not include, for instance, the cost of war or situations where the state is involved, such as uh, uh, wrongful deadly force shootings, as one out of one out of a million people, uh, white males are likely to be hit by get uh, targeted by that, or um, one out of three hundred thousand African American males. So it is a problem, and uh, being able to find a way to understand it and predict and intervene to reduce violent behavior would be helpful for everyone involved. So uh, this is a consciousness conference. And so we, part of it, we wanna talk about the role of consciousness in it. So um, kind of what we're trying to do is understand the, the conscious and unconscious processes that are involved. And this is important because a lot of what happens when we talk about uh, violence is a lot of involves unconscious processes or areas where, where people aren't consciously aware of their tenant, violent tendencies. So, and we base this on the on what's called objective self-awareness theory, which we can also talk to predictive coding, like we talked in before, and I'll get a little bit more what that is in a minute. But the idea is, is that consciousness facilitates between different mental comparisons between uh, ourselves, different aspects of ourselves, and how we fit into the world, and how that relates to our behavior. And we think that violence arises from a loss of self-awareness. So, a set of an uh, inability to be aware of the situation that leads to be uh, that um, leads to failures to predict their own mental states, and uh, this we can tie in again back to neurocognitive model of self, which we're going to talk about more in a moment. So, just a quick overview of violence: it is male-dominated, and I mean that both within gender and in one of the, defin the definitions of biological sex. There is connections with testosterone, but that's not the only reason. As it would be easy to see if you wanted to compare a trans woman to a cis male, I'm sure it wouldn't be a hard guess to find out who's more likely to engage in violence. Um, so it is male dominated and it's also tied to structural inequality. Uh, and we know that a, a minority of individuals are actually committing acts of violence, a uh, very small minority. And we don't think being poor is inherently, uh, or research even shows poor, it being poor uh, is inherently making you violent. Rather there's correlates that involve inequality, such as the increased exposure to violence that may arise in uh, impoverished neighborhoods for all kinds of reasons. And research shows that exposure to violence can be linked to changes and possibly uh, neurological changes, which can be tied into cognitive disorder. And that may one day develop further along into antisocial personality disorder, which we know this because we can show these changes, neurological changes in people who have been exposed to violence, children and adults where we find these within cognitive disorder and we also find these same correlative changes within uh, antisocial personality disorder. So a couple other definitions to talk about when we talk about aggression, that just means that there's an, an engaging act, that uh, behavior that's specifically designed to harm someone else. Violence is a, is a more extreme form of aggression as it is made to create severe injury or death. And we talk about violent criminal, we're talking about people who use violence in pursuit of self-interest. Notice how I did not talk about any kind of state punitive stuff because as I mentioned before, just because state, state governments as well as history has shown have also been capable of sanctioning violent crime within their own ranks. So a couple other definitions, antisocial personality disorder is a, is a diagnosable disorder, it's an access to personality disorder. And it's, it's linked to increased propensities to engage in impulsive antisocial and violent acts. Uh, and it's highly interconnected with a concept called psychopathy, which relates to uh, callousness and impulsivity and a tendency to harm others out of self-interest without remorse. And it was often overlooked, uh, but also very important, is authoritarian personality, which isn't a diagnosis, but rather something that's very notable, really noted by the Milgram's experiment based off the individuals who still continue to inflict acts of violence or thought of acts of violence after a Confederate walked out of the room. Uh, and these individuals tend to be very afraid, tend to be strict, focused on strict acts of convention, tend to be, uh, they see others through perception of hostility, and they will, they, they like to target folks who uh, violate their form of social convention. So people who don't match the religious values, they're overly concerned with other people's sexual interests and sexual identities, and many other things like that. Uh, and so in terms of types of aggression and violence also ties into aggression, this includes violence, is there's two major types of aggression and they are not the same. Uh, hostile reactive aggression is one that's stemming from anger. In this case, you can see this kitten over here or this cat is making a face potentially say at someone who made a man or maybe a dog you could think. And it's reacting to the dog or another cat 
as if it's going to fight. So it's stemming from anger or fear. And that's why it's about to uh, aggress. This is a very different noticeably from a cat who is chasing a mouse or a prey or, or food. This is called instrumental proactive aggression. So it's goal orientated, meaning it, and it's not necessarily to inflict pain, but in the case of a cat, notice it's not, hair is not curled. It looks very different uh, than, it, uh, than the previous one with the, where, where it looked, where we're looking at a dog. So a very, very brief overview of research on the brain. Uh, there are many ways we look at it, and I'm going to actually kind of focus on two, two of these things, uh, but there's the region of interest, and there's a reason I'm bringing this up. Traditionally, re neuroscientists used to go look at specific brain regions, either through traumatic brain injury or lesions, or, they, or through fMRI, and for a minute, I'll talk about it when I was a point in a moment. There's reasons why we kind of moved along to look at brain networks. We still look at regions of interest, but brain networks are kind of large scale because we found, especially like in the case of violence, there's multiple different regions of interest that could be linked to violence. Um, and so that just means we're looking at how large scale brain work networks interact. We also have, uh, we could look at the peripheral nervous system, which relates to some of these brain networks, which are the sympathetic comparison with that nervous system, also known as a fight or flight. And it's also important to note the concept of neuroplasticity, which states that the, it's a principle of the brain that says it can change over, the brain can rewire itself over time. So to mention briefly about traumatic brain injury, because this is kind of where it got interest, uh, and Phineas Cage, by the way, was not, uh, to my knowledge, did not have acquired psychopathy or sociopathy, but Phineas Gage was an individual who got a spike in his head, you know, brought up a lot in neuroscience literature and had a massive change in behavior. What a lot of people probably know about that here, what folks probably do not know is after about a year, there was a lot of improvement and, and apparently no one bothered to bring that up or talk about that after the fact, but Phineas Gage did through plasticity begin to improve. So maybe not have been the end of his life as many of us were led to believe. Either way, some folks can get what through a lesion of the brain was called acquired sociopathy, which can have many of the same symptoms as psychopathy or sociopathy, though it's usually more reactive rather than that instrumental gory goal orientated. So now the reason why we don't um, focus on just regions of interest is because we found so many regions of interest associated with uh, antisocial personality disorder and as well as aggression and violence. And so the most predominant is the orbital frontal, which is right up here, right behind the eye, that uh, like right close to where Phineas Gage got hit, but that one's has been tied for the longest time was thought of being the major source or the major spot where it can be linked to violence. But also the amygdala, the emotional processing center, legions have been tied to that and definitely within reactive thing, the striatum, which kind of, you know, is part, it's a subcortical uh, network uh, that is part of the dopamine track, the dopamine track, the anterior cingulate, which, you know, is kind of the frontal part of the brain. And of course, uh, the precuneus posterior cingulate has also been shown to be linked to violence and antisocial personality disorder. So with all these different areas, it's kind of hard to say that just one's involved. Rather, it's probable that there's a large scale network involvement. So to talk a little bit about brain networks, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna talk about them very briefly, but the salience network, which is kind of like the network that shows you kind of what that's, what focuses on, it, it focuses on the environment, looks for threats, assesses, assesses needs, looks for pleasure, things like that. The cognitive control, executive control, which is the largest one, it's going all the way from the cerebellum to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then the default mode network, which is kind of the, which at once upon a time was, thought to be kind of useless as people used to put people in fMRI researches and told them to do nothing. And the brains did all kinds of stuff because are very different. So they abandoned that for task-based MRI and eventually they noticed uh, uh, that these areas that they ignored were often tied to things that make humans human, like empathy, like mentalization, uh, uh, like social process and self-awareness. And I kind of went through that quickly because I want to speed that these are the ones I want to spin along. But the key thing I'm going to mention the salience network is it is involved with uh, focusing on more uh, on uh, threat evaluation, which is key here. And also it's anti-correlated with the other brain networks, meaning that you're less like when, when it turns on, the others have a tendency to deactivate. When it activates, the others have a tendency to deactivate. If you want to think of an example, but imagine thinking of it, trying to do a math equation and walk down the street and suddenly see a snake. You know, you, 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 could, and you could fight or flight, whatever, but you're not gonna remember what math equation you were working at the time. So that's because the states are disengaged those other parts of the brain to focus on the threat. Uh, executive control, the only thing I'm gonna mention further on this is most research in, in violence in the brain and psychopathy focus on the central executive network. This is important because what I'm gonna propose is taking it a different direction. 
than just the executive vision. Not that it's not important, but that there was more to it. And the default mode network, I kind of mentioned most of the things, but there's a few more moral decision making is possible. And it's also tied to resilience. This is the men and brain model, network model. And so men and put together the, this map and, and should be men and et al. But really it tells you these are made, it, these key nodes which are made spots where many different connections come into these networks and were often looked at. And some of the key ones that you that are relevant here, of course, the anterior sigilla, which came from the insula, uh, the uh, precuneus slash posterior cingulate, uh, and the medial prefrontal cortex, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, because that is also, as we're going to come in, very relevant to what I'm going to get into. But just to give you an idea, Menon, Menon contended that you can look at different kinds of mental diagnoses and behaviors and you could uh, and, and, vari and variations of deviancies and you could find some kind of connection to this map like either a weak connection to the uh, an over connected to the salience network uh, or weaker connections between the, uh, the default mode and the executive control network so to now skip ahead to violence in the brain um, so as i mentioned before most networks tend to focus on the cognitive control executive control network uh, well, and more recently, the salience network and the a default mode network. But the key thing to say here is exposure to violence and acts of violence can be linked to all three brain networks, which is kind of important for understanding the picture because to stop the cycle of violence, you got to understand the impacts of the cycle of violence on the brain. So, brief synopsis of the default mode the, these, you know, there's there structural uh, abnormalities that are connected to it, uh, there's increased resting state activity between key nodes within it. Um, and there are um, some violent psychopaths that put less connectivity to certain tasks. But the long story short of it, the D dot, there's a lot of stuff that leads us to believe that it plays a role inside uh, violent behavior. The salience network also we think plays a role, especially because it involves threat evaluation and we can see structural difference and activation difference. Also, because if you look at people who've been exposed to violence, you'll see what you call a hyperactive salience network because they tend to be overactive at times. Um, and which will get back to me. And psychopaths in particular show uh, increased connectivity between the salient, the amygdala, and key nodes of salient from watching violent movies, hence thinking that maybe they're getting this more emotional feel out of it. And of course, as I mentioned before, the executive control of violence, all kinds of research has been tied to that. But more what I want to get to is the interaction between these brain networks. So quick thing is that exposure to violence can relate to increased connectivity between key nodes of the default mode network, particularly the pecunious, and the posture and the critical region of the assailants are the amygdala. Uh, exposure to violence has also been linked to decreased connectivity between key nodes of the default mode network and key, uh, the, both the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate and a key node the, of the CEN or the dorsal prefrontal cortex. The, the DMN and SN abnormalities were, so here's the thing. So most research focused on the, uh, with adults on the, the prefrontal cortex when they started looking at volumetric and structural differences in children, they found out that there were no deficits in the prefrontal cortex or, or central executor. They were all within the salience network and the uh, posterior cingulate precuneus area. So the thought could be, or a theory could have it, is that these early changes uh, in, uh, that are related to exposure to violence through the principal neuroplasticity over the long term could lead to de decreased connections between the default mode network and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex specifically. Uh, and so researchers have found that, that, that the reason why I bring that up is that area, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, there's an anti-correlation between that, between uh, the, pre the posture sync and the prefrontal cortex that is linked to cognitive perform performance. Uh, and I will also say more recently when I, through data through human connector project, we confirm aggression, ag people with uh, aggression is positively associated with that a decrease anti-correlation in that area. And finally, the, just to mention, because we're gonna tie it into objective self-awareness here, the default mode network is a key for self-referencing and self-awareness. So to jump into objective self-awareness theory, the basic idea is, is we have brains, you know, we have brains, and that brings great models of reality. Uh, and it ties into, and it also models how we fit into that reality. And that if we have some kind of, whenever, uh, and part of that includes a, a, an actual self, which is how we really are, and an ideal self, which is kind of how we try to aim to be and how we like to think of ourselves are. So you could think of it in terms of predictive processing and the, uh, the ideal self is how you predict yourself. And when that deviates from your, your uh, 
your uh, actual self, that's when you kind of have a state of hyper energy and impulsivity and other things go on. But the idea here about the theory itself is when people have a negative of self-evaluation, they think of themselves, but they lose self-esteem. Uh, it leads to, or can lead to low self-awareness, which uh, could be for all kinds of reasons, but when that happens, people tend to externalize their pain. They tend to move from internal external, so like to say, so like decrease default network connections could be part of it. And they tend to misperceive threats and become more violent. So just to kind of tie in why we think it's tied here is we think that the threat processing center of the objective self-awareness theory uh, is kind of part of that. And that can lead, and whenever you have a loss of deconnectivity uh, within, because of, uh, due to loss of self-esteem, self you're gonna see an increased salience network activation, which is going to lead to increased tendencies to hurt others and to uh, inflict pain and, increase, and uh, evaluating threats that may not be present while we expect the other two to be impaired during this time. So that's what the violence is. Now I want to talk about the other thing and why we think that mindfulness is the is a important tool on reducing, if not ending violence. Uh, and first mindfulness, there's many aspects to mindfulness. There's practices, which are like meditation, uh, Tai Chi. Uh, there's also trait mindfulness, which is kind of the idea is how your brain Currently, isn't your it's your propensity to maintain a mindfulness state, and of course, your state mindfulness, which I don't have up here. But all these things we think reduce violence. Uh, in terms of mindfulness compared to objective self awareness, so objective self awareness is like mindfulness, internally focused. It's you're aware of your goals, thoughts, feelings of them in the moment. They both are transcendental. The only thing about objective self awareness is there hasn't been much research outside of your mindfulness to show how it can be extended or maintained or improved upon. Uh, but mindfulness can be improved over time. And it's also important to point out that mindfulness impacts connectivity within all three of these brain networks that we mentioned. Uh, so just to kind of give you a quick overview, uh, trait mindfulness is tied to increased connectivity in that key area we're talking about, the dorsal prefrontal cortex, the, the DL, the PFC, and the PCC, the posterior cingulate. Um, so is trait. Uh, studies have shown that they also have uh, the practices are also linked to them and the traits linked to them. Um, and we, of course, we can see experienced med meditators also show less connectivity between um, key regions of the DAM PFC and the salience network uh, at resting state. So, and in terms of violence, research has shown consistently that violence is reduced, that meditation can be used to reduce violence and, and aggression. And the effect sizes vary from, uh, from high to moderate. So it's been shown to be pretty effective. Uh, and it also has been shown to moderate the relationship between anti-social personality disorder and aggression. And finally, it can be linked to many predictors of violence, such as negative affect, self-esteem, self-compassion, self-regulation. Uh, related heavily to mindfulness is this concept called self-compassion or mindful self-compassion. And there are two different views. Stasny was the original person who conceptualized it. Uh, though his varied so much, Kristin Neff came along later and kind of took a more Buddhist view of it, while Stasi's was kind of more cognitive, described in a cognitive psychology, but they're very, very close in their, how they conceptualized it. Uh, uh, and self-compassion is tied to mindfulness practices, and studies have shown that uh, self-compassion can reduce violence. Um, it's also been connected to one, it can be, it's been shown to impact the salience network directly. It can improve connectivity between all three net, brain networks. And in terms of studies with objective self-awareness theory, it's been shown to reduce impulsivity, reduce negative affect, and, uh, and it's associated with improved self-esteem, even after there is a loss of, so, uh, a, even after the negative, even, so even after there's a loss of self-esteem, there's, uh, I mean, after a lot uh, negative emotion or negative self-evaluation, there's been a certain tendency to maintain self-esteem. Took a moment to get out. So anyways, so self-compassion has been tied to increased activity and critical of the insulin in particular. So uh, that's a very key area. Uh, my compassion-based meditations have been shown to reduce activation in the salience network and increase activity in the orbital frontal cortex, which I mentioned earlier is one of the key areas. Um, uh, and, what, and of course, that was while someone was watching a video of someone in distress. So compassion meditation also strengthens activity uh, in the salience network uh, and the uh, 
the, the medial prefrontal cortex between states and the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, meditation and self-compassion both, uh, but associated with activity in both the salience network and key regions of the default mode network. So self-compassion and violence was self-compassion has been shown to reduce self-reported acts of violence among domestic violence abusers, but self and other partner reported acts of violence. It's been shown to be linked to less aggression and anger. It mediates the relationship between mindfulness practices and criminal impulsivity. And it mediates the link between code of the street, which is uh, a tendency to uh, you, use violence as a means to uh, maintain self-respect and psychopathy among uh, people at risk. And also it's been, it's been linked to improve self-control, emotional regulation and resiliency, resi and the ability to maintain self-awareness after a loss of self-esteem. So these are all correlates again, uh, or negative correlates of violence. So a quick summary of all this is violence has been linked to uh, less activity in the, door, the, the DMNN and, and, the C, C, and the central executive control network, less connectivity between those two, Le less uh, salience network to default mode network connectivity, hyperactivity in the salience network while observing violence, uh, and structural differences. Mindfulness has been shown to improve connectivity between the same regions that seem to be in, uh, 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 diminished in people, people who've been exposed and uh, who engage in violence. You see improved uh, connectivity between the DMN and SN and you find, see less limbic activity associated with the salience network. And of course you see less violence. Okay, so um, in terms of mindfulness meditation on the brain, the big thing that we'd like to take away here is, is that mindfulness meditation allows you to maintain self-awareness. So whenever you have a threat sense of self, which you tie to decreases activity, uh, it, avoid, it, it helps you maintain decisions and avoid situations that could otherwise end in violence. And also it reduces your sensitivity to self-esteem. So just to kind of give a quick bunch of implications to it. So the brain network, uh, this, well, this synopsis is the brain network are mediators to violence. They are important to violence. We do need to explore moderators, gender, as I see gender plays a big part of it. Uh, endocrinological sex, in particular of the definition of sex because testosterone may play a role in inequality uh, and education uh, as the, you know, looking at things like the school to prison pipeline uh, among other things. And of course, exploring applications to mindfulness and very modalities, bring it to schools, like I said, that are at risk for violence, uh, corrections, using it as ways to improve uh, uh, programming within, within prisons and uh, within uh, parole departments and probation departments. Policing, we're already doing research right now looking at mindfulness as a way to reduce race-related deadly force shootings. Military, being able to use it not only to protect people not only to be able to make better decisions abroad so you can see less uh, you know, violence versus the wrong person, it also helps provide resilience for veterans so when they, they, when they come back, they're able to adjust easier. Uh, and of course, specialize that with veterans who are already here and victims of violence because PTSD can be used to treat PTSD. And finally, counseling, notably the only current uh, counseling that has been really shown to have good effects on any access to per personality disorder has been dialectical behavioral therapy, which was based upon mindfulness. So if you have any interest in contacting me, here's my information right here. Uh, and if I'm ready to hear questions. Sorry, I was rushed. Tremendous, and you put your please uh, your email back up there yeah. because I will be in touch with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. super test. Okay, super. Yes, hi, yeah, no, hi, that. that was fabulous. Thank so, um, I am here because I am doing research on non, non, -pharmac non pharmacologic uh, altered states, uh, bliss, etc. But I have a social and personality background, and I also have a personal experience of having been randomly assaulted by someone in the healthcare system who had a wonderful education, Yale, uh, was married to a top uh, faculty member at MIT, and I was assaulted from behind and put in a chokehold, and it was terrible. But from this, I found out, uh, you know, you know, in the aftermath that apparently there, you have another population too, which is uh, caregivers in the healthcare system. And the question is, it seems that they're exposed to violence because they have to care for people who are, you know, perhaps aggressive. Uh, many already have a um, experience in psychiatric hospitals and the like. 
Um, but it, it's something that really needs to be addressed. I found out from uh, law enforcement that this is like a really hidden problem, um, but it, it's abs absolutely prevalent. That is actually a very good point. And I'm glad you brought that up. You know, yeah. uh, I was told the same thing that that's actually like greater risk for serial killers is uh, hospitalized in San Antonio, Texas. There was actually which down the road for me, for me, the city over, there was a serial killer attacking newborns right after they were born and killing them. Oh, why? So. so this is another thing too, which is whether or not people with personality disorders are going into these systems maybe because, or going into these professions, et cetera, which, you know, supports your um, perspective that there's a personality disorder that underlies um, uh, 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 propensity for violence. So, so there's that, but and that's a really interesting question. Um, and then the question of intervention um, in the hospital network is extremely important because it really is a hidden problem. There's a lot of cover up of it. Um, the second thing is this, uh, so I have two other things. Um, so I work with uh, uh, human evolutionary biologist, David Carrier uh, at uh, University of Utah. And he has a very long history uh, running and breathing in mammals, uh, uh, looking at, a, 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 you know, the evolutionary aspects of human behavior, but he has been looking at aggression. And there was one point where he did actually get funding uh, from uh, a law enforcement association, but the NSF, NIH really don't like the kinds of questions that he's asking. So he's having a lot of trouble with funding. But one of the things he found out and argued uh, for is the fact that men actually have evolved facial hair because it greatly lessens the impact of a fist to the face, and he actually had measured that, which is kind of interesting. And the other thing is that males, um, the development of the hips provide men with the ability, you know, unlike women, to pivot away from or pivot after they've been hit, which also lessens the blow greatly. So the physiology, you know, for uh, uh, aggression in males really goes way back, and it goes back, you know, before whatever mm -hmm. the cultural construct is for violence uh, in these times. And I would, I would just love to see that added to, you know, this, the, the, the portrait. Sure, and I think that's why even our skulls, right? With yes. the fact men have bumps on their skulls is to be, to be resilient yeah, to punches. Yeah, but he studied this and he said there's yeah. actually a heck of a lot more damage from uh, a blow to the jaw than a blow to the skull. So, which is kind of interesting. That's yeah. why the facial hair is in the jaw. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah and I, and I'm neither, but yeah, I would say that definitely there's been some, but I also think there's a cultural aspect of violence too. Yes. And that having to adapt more masculine roles and having to be tough and trying to act out in a way to, to have to be able to fight in order to survive in many yeah. cases, yeah. you can also tie. So there's a, there's a, there's a biological piece, but there's also a cultural piece. Yes. This is so important. So I, one more aspect of this question, which has to do Okay, can I have 20 seconds, 30 seconds, which is this, which is the question of social injustice. So there, so people who are low SES do not show a higher propensity for violence, except through this exposure to um, mm -hmm. violence. But I'm asking this because a lot of people who end up in the justice system are exposed uh, and develop PTSD because of injustice. Uh, and violence is not necessarily physical violence shown toward them. And I'm just wondering whether or like not- Like oppressive that, violence? Sorry? Yeah, like oppressive violence? Yeah, no, okay. there's a whole- we, I could go in a separate, whole literature. That, okay, that, yeah, that, that is a whole separate, but no, that is because you, through oppression, yeah. you know, you take people away from their access to medicine and access to food yes. that puts them in situations where, yeah, it's going to hurt them. Okay. And it's going it's, it's aggressing with them indirectly. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morley. And uh, next up, round of applause for Dr. Morley. Next up, we have Alex Seeloff. And he's a local from University of Arizona, a graduate student in um, social psychology and existential psychology. And he's going to be talking today about mystical type experiences in the psychedelic therapeutic process. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Alex Siwoff. I'm a third year PhD student here at the University of Arizona studying social psychology, emphasizing in existential psychology. And so today I'm going to talk about an empirical model of mystical type experiences in psychedelic therapy as informed by terror management theory. So I'm going to start with uh, an overview of terror management theory. I'm going to talk a little bit about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and then introduce this novel theoretical model. A quick definition here is that when I'm talking about psychedelics, I'm talking about the classic psychedelics, the ones most likely to induce a mystical type experience. And so a little bit about terror management theory, originally founded in 1986, 
is it, an, it is an empirically supported theory with well over a thousand studies supporting its core hypotheses, over 35 years of research and cross-cultural validity. It also helped establish the subdiscipline of experimental existential psychology, a subdiscipline that's under social psychology. And so the core premise of terror management theory is the idea that uh, the human biological predisposition to continue living came into conflict once humans develop the awareness that one's own death is inevitable. So this is the idea that I'm aware that no matter what I do, I'm gonna die someday. The idea is that that awareness came into conflict with this hum human biological predisposition to continue living. And so this conflict aroused a existential anxiety that needed to be managed. Uh, but it's this anxiety that elicits a potentially debilitating terror. And this potentially debilitating terror is what needs to be managed. And so the solution is that we manage it via our anxiety buffers. And as the theory goes, the anxiety buffer consists of three parts, our cultural worldviews, our self-esteem, and our close relationships. So our cultural worldview offers a framework of belief that we can uh, live up to. And when we live up to these beliefs, it offers us self-esteem. And then close relationships serve to buffer that whole process uh, because we belong to social groups and our family members believe in similar things as us. Therefore, when we live up to our cultural worldview beliefs, uh, they can tell us good job, thereby earning us extra self-esteem. And so then this is an enduring solution to an enduring problem. The, the problem of death is always there. It's always accessible in conscious awareness. Uh, so this problem needs an enduring solution, uh, which is this cultural worldview, self-esteem and close relationships. And it's enduring because it's sort of this project. It gives us something we can uh, wake up and do on a day-to-day -day basis and spend our days involved in. This is why Ernest Becker, um, one of the, he's a cultural anthropologist who a lot of terror management theory was founded on. He called it an immortality project because it's a project one can work on their whole lives that gives you a sense of immortality. And so then terror management theory takes a perspective of at least some psychiatric symptoms. And this starts at the question, what if one's anxiety buffer is not adequately managing death anxiety? This leads to a situation with excess unmanaged death anxiety, which leads the person to find other attempts to manage the death anxiety. And one potential uh, is the development of psychiatric symptoms. So the empir empirical support for this idea comes from one of terror management theory's three core hypotheses, which is the mortality salience or MS hypothesis, which is the, the idea that reminding people of death will lead to an increased need for their anxiety buffer or whatever methods they're using to manage the terror. And so the empirical support for this comes from studies where you randomly assign half of people to be reminded of death and have to be reminded of a control topic. And what we find is that the people reminded of death, it leads to a bolstering of the anxiety buffer. So whether it's bolstering of the cultural worldview via things like treating similar other people more kindly, uh, you're, so it's an in-group bias, or uh, reminding people of death will increase aggression towards out-group members, or it could bolster self-esteem through things like self-serving attributional biases, or it could bolster close relationships. So reminding people of death leads to an increase in things like attraction for romantic partners uh, or increasing the des desire for children. And of most relevance for today's talk is that reminding people of death also exacerbates psychiatric symptoms. So in 2007, a series of three studies uh, examined the idea that these uh, social phobias, arachnophobias, and compulsive hand-washing behaviors uh, exist as an attempt to manage this underlying terror. Uh, and what they found is that remind, the people reminded of death, it did indeed exacerbate, uh, it, it made people who had pre-existing social phobias more likely to, uh, more avoidant of a social group. It made uh, existing arachnophobics more uh, phobic of spiders, and it made people with pre-existing compulsive hand-washing tendencies uh, it increased the time they spent washing their hands. It increased the amount of soap they used and the amount of paper towels that they used. Uh, and like I said, this only uh, happened for the people with pre-existing like higher levels of these phobics, uh, phobias and compulsive tendencies. Uh, again, indicating that those uh, behaviors exist in an attempt to manage death anxiety because reminding them of death increased the need uh, for this method of managing their terror. 
some more support for this idea of death anxiety being a transdiagnostic construct. Uh, mortality salience also increased scrupulosity. And we also find strong positive correlations between death anxiety and uh, people, these are all treatment seeking people uh, with a variety of mental health diagnoses. Then there's also uh, anxiety buffered disruption theory, which in, was developed in 2011, uh, but it's an extension of terror management theory to explain PTSD. Uh, it's essentially the, the idea that PTSD is the result of a shattered anxiety buffer. Then we have psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. A lot of people in this room are probably aware uh, after just one, maybe two doses, along with therapeutic support, it leads to lasting improvement on a wide variety of diagnoses. But this is a really novel approach. And part of the novelty comes from the fact that it's a single drug treating a variety of supposedly distinct diagnoses. And it's also a pharmacological treatment that only requires one dose, which is of course very different from most pharmacological treatments we're familiar with today, where people need to take it on a day-to-day -day basis. So of course this raises the questions of why and how psychedelic therapy is doing what it's doing. And a lot of researchers these days are pointing to the mystical type experience, uh, but to me that's just kind of kicking the can down the road. It's because then we have the question of why our mystical type experiences leading to lasting improvement on this wide variety of diagnoses. So at the most basic level, the question that I'm asking is, are the mystical type experiences repairing a person's anxiety buffer, which in turn reduces their reliance on the psychiatric symptoms that they're using to manage existential anxiety? So if this is the case, how is it happening? And for this, I'm going to turn to the work of Robert J. Lifton, who outlined five modes of death transcendence. The first being the biosocial mode. So the bio piece of this speaks to having children and living on in your children. The social piece of this speaks to belonging to social groups that are larger and more enduring than yourself. The theological mode of death transcendence is, of course, the religious answer. Uh, and again, religion provides a framework of belief that one can live up to, uh, along with um, if you live up to those things, you gain some sort of immortality at the end of your life. And the creative mode is through works of art or through creative endeavors where you put some part of the self into some project that gets created in the external world, whether that be through things like traditional works of art, or maybe you're an entrepreneur and you start a business. And the natural mode of death transcendence is through identifying with nature. So if I'm at one with nature, uh, when I die, I can be returned to nature and live on uh, maybe through the molecules of my body being returned to nature. And so each of these first four modes of death transcendence can fall into this larger umbrella of cultural worldview beliefs. Because these each, as I was mentioning, provide a, a set of beliefs and a framework that one can live up to, it's something that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that when you live well by that code, you earn self-esteem. So biosocial, you can be a good parent, you can be a good member of your country, be a good patriot, uh, theological, be a good uh, Christian. If you're a good Christian, you can um, get access to heaven. Um, a good artist, uh, creating a good business, creating a, com a successful company, or natural, maybe being a good environmentalist. But then the fifth mode of death transcendence that Robert Lifton outlined is called the experiential mode, which he himself described as being of a different order from the others and is in fact the indicator of the other four modes. And mystical type experiences fall under this category. They are one flavor of experiential transcendence. And Robert Lifton went on to say that experiential transcendence is uh, most impactful, it is most effective at transcending death when it's connected to one of the other four modes, when it's connected to biosocial, theological, creative, or natural. And so then we have the question, how does experiential transcendence or these mystical type experiences help strengthen a person's anxiety buffer? And so you recall uh, that Lifton said that the experiential mode is the indicator of the other four modes. And I think that it's perhaps the indicator in the sense that during a person's mystical type experience, uh, say during psychedelic therapy, they witness and they see something that's intrinsically meaningful to them, something that's intrinsically um, aspects of their worldview. And quick definition here, extrinsic things are things that are means to an end. So for example, holding a job as a means to an end of earning money 
that's extrinsic versus a job that you enjoy just for the sake of the job. You do the work for the sake of the work. That's an intrinsically held job. Um, so again, I think people during their mystical type experiences are witnessing um, and experiencing things that are intrinsically meaningful to them. And then what happens during the post-dosing integration period, and, and, and what I'm suggesting is a good therapeutic target, is to help um, and I think this is already happening basically, is that therapists are helping to integrate what's intrinsically meaningful, what that, whatever they witnessed during the mystical experience, uh, integrate that into the client's worldview. And then once this happens, the anxiety buffer should be more adequately managing existential anxiety, therefore reducing their need for these uh, more maladaptive attempts at managing anxiety. And so I introduce the anxiety buffer reparation model of psychedelic therapy. And so this starts at the left side of this picture here at the state of a person's anxiety buffer going in. Uh, so it can be functional and effective, meaning they're using adaptive terror management methods already, meaning their cultural worldview, their self-esteem and their close relationships are effectively managing existential anxiety. Or it could be at the bottom here where it's a shattered anxiety buffer, uh, which as I mentioned before, is essentially PTSD. If you wanna learn more about that, I'll point you to anxiety buffer disruption theory. But in the middle, if it's a partly or fully ineffective anxiety buffer, it means that there's some mixture of adaptive methods and maladaptive terror management methods, which here I'm just gonna lump all together as clinical symptoms. So if a person starts there, they enter into psychedelic therapy or some other mystical type experience uh, occasioning activity. And then we can ask the question, did they have a mystical experience? If not, it could be worth giving it another try, um, but you'll notice there's an asterisk there uh, because a few retry attempts um, may be fruitful, but of course criteria should be implemented to avoid this becoming an endless loop. But if a person did experience a mystical experience, we can go on to ask the question, did they experience something intrinsically meaningful during their experience? If not, again, it could be worth retrying with the same caveat, but if yes, we can move on to the question, okay, was that insight integrated into the worldview? And did they take actionable steps to live in alignment with these beliefs? Uh, because you can't just believe in your worldview, you have to live up to it. That's how you're in the self-esteem. Um, so if this happens, the idea is that their anxiety buffer should be more effectively managing existential anxiety and that the maladaptive methods of managing terror should fall away of their own weight. Um, so this is taking the perspective that treat the cause and the symptoms should fall away of their own weight. And so one of the strengths I think of this is that this is very congruent with a lot of the existing protocols. I mean, psychedelic therapy is already being very effective in, um, in these trials. And I think part of that comes from the fact that this process is already happening, even if it wasn't designed with this intention in mind. Then I want to make a caveat on the construct of mystical type experiences. Uh, this isn't the focus of my talk, but I, and this is kind of a resounding theme I've noticed at other presentations during this conference is that I think this construct of what we call a mystical type experience and how we measure it, I think it could use some updating and some expanding um, because there's, um, there's a lot more there. I don't think you need to, you know, get over 60% criteria on the MEQ 30 in order to witness something that's intrinsically meaningful to you after taking psychedelics. So a few implications in future directions with this work. So as I mentioned, this is connecting psychedelic therapy to terror management theory, which is a well-established empirically validated theory from existential psychology with well over a thousand studies, 35 years of research and cross-cultural validity. And this also offers a framework and potential methods for considering other diagnoses to treat. Um, as I mentioned, the mortality salience paradigm, we can remind people of death and see if it increases uh, their symptomology. And then also something that this model does is if a client is unresponsive to psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, this framework offers therapists a place to look for potential pivot points in their therapeutic uh, approach to this to a given client. Uh, as I mentioned, terror management theory has well over a thousand studies uh, and it's a very rich empirical framework. And this model is also implicating the experience more so than the drugs. And as we know, psychedelics are not the only thing that induces mystical type experiences or related phenomena. Uh, I think breathwork is another uh, excellent target for this. And I believe Johns Hopkins is already doing this work. And then um, as David Yaden and colleagues have found uh, ritual and religious activity also seem to induce similar experiences or they can. 
And then of course, an important note is that this model is outlining the adaptive therapeutic use of these experiences, but these experiences have risks when they're not properly or safely experienced or integrated. And this model also suggests what to keep in focal attention, which I wanna argue is culture especially. So it's a cultural worldview that's unique to each individual. There's of course overlap from person to person, but ultimately uh, a person's cultural worldview is unique and is their own. And it's gonna vary widely, especially among treatment seeking populations. So one implication of this is I think that we could establish what are the core therapeutic protocols that need to be necessary and, and present in any um, psychedelic therapy setting? And what can we allow to vary uh, to match the client's cultural worldview? I think some really easy, simple examples of this are just even the artwork that's in the room that they do therapy in, or the music they listen to, uh, or the, the therapist themselves. Um, I think one potential for this uh, could be to allow and encourage even the therapists to bring a part of their own worldview beliefs into the therapy room. Uh, and then clients can seek therapists whose worldviews are similarly aligned. And of course, I, I'm working on a theory paper on this uh, to be published either by the end of this year or early next year. And also a quick side note on this uh, from our friend George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I'm not trying to say that this is the correct way to look at mental diagnoses or psychedelic therapy. I'm saying that this is a useful way. Uh, and I think that it has uh, a lot more use than um, at least a lot of the, the answers that we've been seeing so far in psychedelic therapy. And thank you very much. Again, my name is Alex Siloff. I'm here at the University of Arizona. And if you're interested in reading farther about any of these concepts, uh, you can read The Denial of Death. Uh, terror management theory was largely founded on the work of cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker, uh, especially his book, Denial of Death. If you want to learn more about terror management theory and the empirical work there, you can check out the Handbook of Terror Management Theory published just four years ago. Uh, and if you wanna learn more about this model in specific, I began outlining a lot of these ideas in my master's thesis, um, which was published just in December. You can find it by searching that title. Thank you. Great talk, very interesting. Um, can you go back to that slide with the five different um, responses to terror? I, 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 I think I, didn't fully understand how the first four relate to this the one? fifth. Like, what does it mean that the others are indicator, indicator of the other four modes? Yeah, yeah, so um, the experiential is the indicator of the other four modes. Um, and, and what I mentioned on the next slide is how um, when a person is in, for example, a, a mystical experience, the, the content that they experience or the things that they do that bring them into this experiential state are very much connected to the other four modes. Uh, so for example, um, if a person experiences during their mystical experience, like some sort of relational dynamic with like another person where there's maybe conflict or something, um, something comes up there and it's like an attempt to reprocess that or something. And that's basically pointing to like, if content like that comes up during their experience, it's suggesting that it's intrinsically meaningful for them. Uh, so another thing is like, if people encounter some, like some people say they meet God during their experience, uh, those are likely gonna be religious people or something with something with an existing, either pre-existing belief, or maybe it causes them to create a new belief that now they are a believer. Um, so the idea is that like, and, and also like experiential transcendence isn't only mystical type experiences. It, it can also be, um, the one my mentor likes to use is like a grandfather getting on the floor and like playing with their grandchild and like just kind of losing their sense of time and just like being absorbed in this experience. Um, that That's pointing to the fact that that's an intrinsically meaningful part of that grandparent's life. Does that make sense? Yes, kind of supporting and enhancing of the other modes exactly yeah so he said it's of a different order from the others in fact indicator so like an indicator in the sense that i think the things that a person does in life that bring them into an experiential state of transcendence are pointing to what's it's like indicating to that person what's meaningful to them in a sense okay awesome thank you yeah yeah 20 seconds. This was fabulous, and I believe this is comprehensive, but I, uh, you might uh, already have been in, looked into or might um, appreciate 
uh, the concept of flow by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, yeah. uh, grandfather getting on the floor to play with the child, but a lot of other uh, uh, contexts of behavior in which one skill set matches the demands of the uh, of, of of the experience. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah very connected. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alex, that was great. Um, so this is the end of this uh, workshop. So we're done for this evening. So enjoy yourself and uh, well done to everyone. Appreciate the presentations. Thank you. Thank you.